despite this source of immense happiness, I walked into my boss's office and announced that I was moving to Vancouver to stop ever being a corporate whore. Oh my goodness. Seven minutes. <laughs> Lordy Pete. This will be part historical record and part cautionary tale. In a cubicle in an advertising agency in an industrial park in 1995, sits a small, quiet man named Dave. Please do not ever call me Dave. <laughs> While having a nervous breakdown, he imagines his entire career as West Coast performance artist, demon wrestler, Mr. Fireman. Please do not disturb. Look at this happy guy, come on. That's a guy having a good life. He doesn't need to do anything different. He's making lots of money. He's got respect, a good job. He's got a boss who asks him to generally draw more chicken. <laughs> Possibly with more fries. It was an easy life, you know. Uh, he's banging the receptionist. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> this is the peak of my illustration career. The back panel of the Dunkaroos package. A Betty Crocker job. Uh, strangely, despite this source of immense happiness, I shortly afterwards walked into my boss's office and announced that I was moving to Vancouver to stop ever being a corporate whore <laughs> ever again. Shortly after that, I, I was less brave and left him a message on his phone to go and fuck himself. <laughs> I moved to Vancouver. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Sorry, Liam. Jeez, buddy. <laughs> About a year later, I was working, uh, uh, hanging my paintings at a restaurant called Incendio down in Gastown. That was my, uh, my, ended up being my gallery for 14 wonderful years. Uh, uh, this painting earned me approximately half of what I made of that last image and took a year to make. And uh, anyway, there you go. That's the, that's the view from the ceiling. Uh, significantly more complicated. Good times. I hooked up with an artist collective called the Church of Point and Sisteria uh, down on Hastings Street. We made uh, paintings in performance and, uh, and while uh, a very skilled man in Ketter James made poetry live on the scene. It was a good time. This is the view from our front window with some embellishments. Uh, <laughs> the hunger and crack dealers were all real. I promise you that. Uh, my commissions continued, including uh, a, a long relationship with an unnamed Irish bar that I would have to say ended very poorly when I unveiled damaged art uh, in front of the owner and dared him to kill me with a walking stick in front of 150 witnesses. Uh, and then a short time later, completely unrelated, I was a penniless naked hippie up on the Sunshine Coast. The first thing I wanted to do when I was there was make a big-ass Gandalf pipe because that would help me integrate with the community. <laughs> How do you make a big-ass Gandalf pipe is an excellent question. Uh, it turns out to be a simple matter of heating up your wire and jamming it into the end of the stick. So you need a source of fire, a piece of wire, and a certain amount of time and patience. Uh, after that, uh, it's just a matter of scaling that sucker up if you want to have yourself a big horn. Oh, now hold on, I have a prop. This is the first horn. This is the very first one, it still exists. And I'm going to even try and hog it in front of you right now. There's my moment of transformation. <laughs> There's no going back after that. So I reinvented myself. Uh, if you want to be popular in Roberts Creek, show up at the drum jam with your big ass Gandalf pipe and your new honky stick. Unfortunately, the Presbyterians for whom I was the unpaid temporary caretaker replacement person were less than impressed with my transformation and promptly told me it was time to move back to Vancouver. So here I am, uh, back in Vancouver, up on the stage at the Railway Club with one Super Robertson at the Super Robertson Supper Show. This was a, an event I could disturb as often as possible because it was Wednesday night and it was 7 o'clock. 
We did that for about eight years, and that's where the Legion of Flying Monkeys Horn Orchestra first developed, just as a jammy band first, increasing complexity. Uh, because I'm an illustrator, I love making the poster more than anything else. And you can see me <laughs> applying the horns and the monkey theme and pretty much every image following this. <laughs> Down in, the, in Gastown, we had a, a place called Batalong that was uh, uh, an art venue, uh, and a burlesque venue, good times. About the same time, started a clown parade. We maraud through Gastown in December to stave off the darkness. Um, good, uh, good versus depression, I gotta say, and a fine excuse to honk a horn. <laughs> You'll notice there was no money in this plan so far. <laughs> so I started dog walking. <laughs> dog walking. You wouldn't think it would be an important decision in my life, but uh, it turns out my client was super hot enviro sculptor Sharon D. Callis. And uh, so naturally I started leaving her notes about my adventures with her dog, which totally worked. Don't look, Liam. I'm gonna go back, Liam. You wanna turn around and have a look at that, buddy? All right. You have the internet, buddy. You'll be all right. <laughs> Sharon and I have had 10 years of marvelous collaboration together, regardless of the fact that I was never again paid for walking her dog. <laughs> We're still co-managing uh, many things, including the, the means of production garden, uh, which is up at East 6 in St. Catharines. Here's a poster from a, a show. Uh, the means of production garden, the MOP garden, a really great place to put on an event have yourself an outdoor concert when the weather is good and the sun is shining. Play some music. Host yourself a fancy tea party where people come out dressed up nice and have tea and cookies. Get some attractive young people to get their biology on your honkers while they take pictures. <laughs> I love that stuff. That's... Yay! But most importantly, this is where we grow the horns. That is a young empress tree that has been brutally cropped in a method called pollarding. Uh, don't you worry, a month and a half later, she's sprouting new horns. And there they are about two months later. An amazing tree, a hardwood that grows hollow tubes that'll put out 18 foot in a year. There is a fresh harvest uh, from a year's growth from one tree. Please don't hate me because I'm wealthy. <laughs> I regularly blog about horn making uh, for the seven, possibly eight people who follow me. <laughs> and the band is gigging. After many years, we have uh, a significant horn section and uh, uh, the rest of the band backing us up. That's the Maker Fair. This is a uh, wood studio, a place called, uh, an event called Pancakes and Jam. Uh, more hippies, please. <laughs> and we just got back from Catalonia. This is us playing at the, uh, the wine festival in a little town called Artes, where after three visits, we are totally famous. <laughs> There's over 1,500 people live in that town, my friends. Uh, lately, my studio practice uh, is in the McLean Park Field House. Uh, Colin mentioned that earlier. Um, we call it Uncle Hookie's Fabulous Horn Shop, and uh, uh, still making lots of horns. There's a slightly bigger one. If you come to the Interurban tomorrow night between 5 and 10, you'll, you'll see that one in practice. We have a regular carving class. My gang is always carving spoons. I, I can't get them off the spoons for some reason. They're just crazy for spoons, spoons, spoons. So I make endless fun of them on the internet. <laughs> like I'm catching them in the act. They routinely stage a coup, and kill me in cold blood. And it does not matter one whit because we're having a good time. There you go, kids. Uh, growing more horns. That is the end of my presentation. I hope you come and sing along with us at the break. We've got some music for you and the band playing just down that hallway. My name is Mr. Fireman. Thank you very much.